Meguiar's presents Car Crazy, the show that focuses on the people behind the cars. And now, our host, Barry Maguire. Most kids like to play with cars, but for some, it becomes an obsession. This type of person, and there are millions of us, have an unusual preoccupation with cars. And sometimes, it is not at all rational. Indeed, we are talking about people of all ages and all walks of life who are certifiably car crazy. Hi, I'm Barry Maguire, and I've spent my entire life working and associated with people who are crazy about their cars. This show is intended to gain insight into these people and understand why they are so car crazy. It's been called a contagious disease, and we hope this show will help you catch the bug, if you haven't already. Today on Car Crazy, we'll visit with Vic Edelbrock Jr. as he continues the family legacy of high performance. Next, we'll talk with racing legend Carol Shelby, who's done it all in the world of racing. Also, we'll talk with J.B. Nedica and tour his museum that houses some of the most impressive cars ever made. Don't go away, there's a lot more car crazy coming right up. For obvious reasons, I have a special affinity for family businesses, and one of the families that is legendary in the field of hot rodding is the family Edelbrock. Their business is speed, and it goes all the way back to the very beginnings of hot rodding in the 30s. Let's go inside and meet Vic Edelbrock. The Edelbrock family has been a cornerstone of the performance industry since its inception. They've been a part of the genesis of hot rodding. Vic Edelbrock Sr. had a knack for knowing how an engine should run and more importantly, how to tune it to run better and faster. In 1938, he bought his first project car, a 1932 Ford Roadster. This car was Vic's entry into the world of hot rods and inspired the design and manufacture of the very first Edelbrock manifold, which was called the Slingshot. Vic tested his new manifold at the Muroc Dry Lake races, where he was a consistent winner, reaching up to speeds of 112 miles per hour. The other racers were so impressed with the slingshot that the request for the manifold became the driving force behind what was to become the Edelbrock's performance parts business. Vic was known for his fast flatheads and his race-winning midgets. He was the first to mix nitromethane in his fuel. With that kind of power in his tank and Roger Orr behind the wheel, Vic's V860 equipped midget made history when it broke the winning streak of the Offy equipped midgets. It was the first and only V860 win at the famous Gilmore Stadium. His competitors had no idea what caused that strange smell and color coming out of his exhaust. After World War II, Vic opened an auto repair and machine shop, which was to develop into the huge corporation it is today, managed by his son, who continues to carry on the tradition laid out by his father. Today, the Edelbrock Corporation is a publicly traded company with over 650 employees at four Southern California facilities, totaling over 400,000 square feet. Originally known for their manifolds, Edelbrock manufactures an ever-growing range of high-performance and mileage enhancement products. They call it the Total Power Package. It includes carburetors, water pumps, heads, and more. The growth of this one-time parts manufacturer and small speed shop into an automotive world giant is due mainly to Vic Edelbrock, Jr., a brilliant businessman, accomplished racer, family man, and another car-crazy compatriot of ours. We sat down with Vic to get the inside story of this family's winning tradition. The family Edelbrock has been part and parcel of the hot rod hobby since its very beginnings back in the 30s. And, and of course, we're talking about your dad at that time. And uh, can we go into a little bit of how he first got the bug for cars? One thing my father had, that a lot of people don't know is he had a, a vision and a feel for an engine. Never went to engineering school. Never went past the ninth grade because the family grocery store burnt down. They all had to go to work. But he really left a tremendous foundation for a young kid of 26 years old to, uh, to allow me to do what I've done. Let's go back when you're a kid. Lots of activity involving the car. Is there, is there a, a certain moment in time when you knew you just, this was going to be your life? I knew it 
almost off the get-go, you know, when I used to go down with my father in, in, uh, in his little garage when I was three or four years old, and one day I was sitting on a bench and two guys went like this, and I went, I went fanny, fanny first into a bucket of gunk, and my <laughs> mother was not very happy about that. And I used to go down and follow my father around and get in trouble and love to do things, and started working there after school and or during the summer when I was 11, 12 years old, putting little screws and fittings or whatever I could do. And, and it was just always there, you know, that goes back to the midget days when I could work on it. And as my father kind of backed out of the program and in the early 50s, when I turned 16, I wasn't supposed to be in the pits until you're 21, but I snuck in anyway. And I would go with Bobby Minx who took care of the car and we'd kind of run it for a couple of years and, you know, my summers and such and help take the car apart when it was done. And I got to take the engine apart, but I couldn't put it together. And, Things like that. Those were those were real high moments, and of course now vintage car racing is my passion, and uh, and it's really something that's been in my heart for years that I've wanted to do. I finally, starting in 1987, 88, I finally got to go out and put that driver's suit on and, and, and that helmet and go out and, and and run a car around a track, and that still is top on my list. Any experience in your life with cars that sticks out over the other, as far as being extraordinary, uh, especially. Uh, uh, memorable in your mind. I recreated the black roadster that my father had because it's man has it's not for sale. We did an article for Hot Rod and we were down in down in uh, uh, El Segundo then, so we went down on the beach and had the car on the on the road down there, the bike path. And here comes this old guy on a bicycle, and he's looking over my shoulder in, in, in the engine, and he says, "Is that Vic Edelbrock's roadster?" And I says, "Well, it's not the real one, but it's a replica of it." He said, I knew him well. I used to race with him at the dry lake bits uh, before and after the war. That kind of stuff. Real, real moments in, in my life that uh, helped put this all together. Well, Vic, obviously you've experienced enormous success, but uh, how much sweeter is it that your daughters are in your business with you? Uh, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to put it in words, Barry, because it's just, it's just so great that they're here and that uh, they're involved. We're all having lots of fun. We call ourselves the fun team. Well, Vic, it's been special to share some time with you in front of a camera so our viewers can kind of get insight into the family Edelbrock and the passion that burns within you for cars and uh, for the family unit and all the things that have made you what you are. You're a very special guy. Thank you, Barry. I really appreciate that. Don't go away. There's a lot more car crazy when we come back. Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest confirms our belief that some people are born with oil in their veins and speed in their soul. For over 50 years, he's been racing, designing, and manufacturing cars. In fact, there's enough evidence that the car has been his work, his child, and his passion that there can be no other conclusion. Carol Shelby is car crazy. When it comes to the world of motor racing, Carol Shelby is one of our greatest national treasures. He is a world champion driver, team manager, and is the only American automobile manufacturer to ever win the FIA World's Manufacturer Championship. Carroll's love for racing cars began at an early age. It was obvious he had a gift. He could squeeze a low extra speed out of any car. As a teenager in Texas, he raced jalopies, the predecessors to stock car racing, and soon moved on to MGs, Allards, and then road racing. At the onset of World War II, he enlisted in the Army, and our government, taking notice of Carroll's need for speed, soon asked him to become a pilot. After World War II, Carroll knew that his future was in sports car racing, and the place to make a name for himself was on the racing circuits of Europe. He became a gun for hire. His natural driving ability and talent made him quickly sought after. In the 1950s, he drove for Ferrari, Maserati, and Aston Martin. His greatest single victory as a driver came at Le Mans in 1959. In 1960, a heart problem forced him to retire from driving, but Shelby's racing career was just beginning. He was going to become a sports car manufacturer. Shelby realized to succeed, he needed to have a relationship with a large manufacturer, and Ford had just developed a small, powerful new V8. In 1962, he made it the 260 cubic inch V8 engine with a light chassis of a struggling British company, AC Cars. The Cobra was an instant success off and on the track. The ferocious little car caught the imaginations of America, beating the Corvettes, Jaguars, and Ferraris. 
In 1965, the Cobra Daytona Coupe was built by hand by a bunch of California hot riders, and it snatched the coveted FIA World's Manufacturers Championship right out of the pocket of Enzo Ferrari to become the first and only American manufacturer to ever win the prize. In 1965, Henry Ford approached Shelby to manage a team of GT40s in order to win the 24-hour at Le Mans. It was the most coveted prize in road racing and Ford made several attempts during the early 60s with no success. Henry spared no expense for that effort, including a failed attempt at taking over the Ferrari company itself. Shelby came through and led Ford's GT40 team to victory at Le Mans in 1966 and again in 1967, pairing Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt to set a new record, covering 3,267 miles with an average speed of 135 miles per hour. In the golden age of racing, Shelby could do no wrong. I had a chance to sit down with Shelby at the annual Cobra Day at the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles. Cobra Day is the largest gathering of authentic Cobras in the world. Nearly 100 Cobras come together annually for this event. With the average value of each of these cars being $200,000, and only about a thousand Cobras existing in the world, this showcase represents almost 10% of the world's Cobra population with an approximate total value of over $20 million. Well, Carol, you're really amongst all your children out here. What, what does it feel like to be amongst uh, so much of your offspring here today and seeing all these people enjoying them so much? Uh, Barry, at this point in my life, to still be here, to see all of these Cobras, all of these enthusiastic people, and so many of the little grandchildren and great-grandchildren named Shelby. <laughs> That's true, you know, it really is true. Carol, you're the bigger-than-life John Wayne personality of this hobby with enormous passion. Can we go back to the beginning and talk about the genesis of that passion? What was the start of it? My father was a rural mail carrier. But when I was three years old, I used to ride with him, and I'd say, go faster, Daddy, let's go faster. And by the time I was five years old, every car that we met on the highway, I could tell you what it was, whether it was a 28 Chevy, whether it was a uh, 28 Model A, or whether it was a Durant, or whether it was a Moon, or whatever it was, I could tell you what it was. And I've always loved cars. I've never lost that passion. Cars and airplanes. Obviously, you always had speed in your blood. What was your true first racing experience? I started trying to build my own car with my friend Ed Wilkins from Dallas and uh, got run out of the house because uh, we were making too much noise at night, trying to bang the fenders around. We were trying to put a Hemi in a chassis that Ed had built. One morning, I said, all I've ever wanted to do is drive race cars, so why don't I just do it? Let's see if I can make a living. Three years later, I was driving for a factory team in Europe. But all during that time, I still wanted to build my own car. And as interested as I was in driving race cars, the main thing that I wanted to do was see how the little European companies, Aston Martin, Ferrari, Maserati, how they built their cars and how they operated. Well, as a race driver, you were king of the hill in 1959. What was going on inside Carroll Shelby? The biggest thing that went on t inside of Carroll Shelby is that last five laps at Le Mans. I heard more transmission problems. I heard the engine <laughs> going away on me that last five laps. And finally, I just practically prayed that nothing was happening, that it was all my ears and my imagination. And uh, we won that race. And it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me in racing, probably outside of uh, winning the championship as a driver. Uh, with Aston Martin and then building my own cars that won the world championship. Yes. That was a big thrill too, Barry. That, that had to be, to build a car from scratch. Right. I got to say the Shelby Cobra is at the top of the list out of all the cars of all time. How does that make you feel? I thought, I thought it would go away. I thought nobody would ever think anymore about them. They'd do a lot of other cars. And here, 35 years later, you see all of these out here, which uh, I think you can probably imagine how proud that makes me feel, how lucky it makes me feel, too, how lucky I am to even be here. And we are, too, Carol. Lucky to be here with you. Stay tuned, folks. We'll be right back with more Car Crazy. Welcome back to Car Crazy. Carol Shelby is an American automotive legend with charisma, vision, and the ability to make him one of the few automotive icons to have ever worked with all three of the American automobile manufacturers. Not the type of man to rest on his laurels, Shelby continues his legacy with yet another contribution to automotive history, his new car, the Series 1. 
Making its world debut in this radical roadster comes as close to driving a race car on the street as you can get. Using cutting edge technology, the Series 1 is a reflection of the many facets of its designer, Carol Shelby. I asked Carol to tell us a little bit more about the development of his new car. We're in production. It's a wonderful car that I'm proud of and uh, sweat my app. I wanted to see if I could build one more car that would sell. And sure enough, we've got two or three more on the, bo on the board. Now, now. Yeah, you're kind of the bionic man. You do have these uh, replacement parts that you can oh, give yeah. to I've got uh, transplanted heart, transplanted kidney from my wonderful son, Mike, that, that uh, saved my life four years ago last January. And uh, as lucky as I am, you have to put it back. Every day is Christmas for me, Barry. <laughs> it sure is. So we enjoy it right along with you. Thank you. Can you, what's the best thing about the car hobby? Can you, can you capture one thing or a couple of things you think that's the, the, what you enjoy most about the car hobby? I enjoy the, the car hobby mostly, Barry, because of the people that are in it. The, the people, the, as you just mentioned, the passion and seeing the passion that these people have for their cars, this, this is terribly important to them. This is a very important part of their life. And when you see all of the pressures that society puts on families today and people, for them to have something like this that can take some of that pressure off, mm -hmm. I think that it's just fabulous. I think that it really helps a lot of people survive in this uh, society that we live in today. Carol Shelby is truly an inspiration. We're proud to call him car crazy. Keep your meter running, because we'll be right back with a lot more car crazy. Got it. Welcome back to Car Crazy. The Nethercut Collection in Silmar, California is one of the finest car collections in the world. Its benefactor, J.B. Nethercut, is expanding his museum and we've come to the grand opening. The ceremony is just beginning and look who's on the rostrum kicking off and today's marvelous event. Here, my buddy my name is Bruce, Bruce Meyer. Meyer. It is my pleasure and I really should say my my honor and privilege to be here this morning to welcome you to the grand opening of the Nethercut Museum. As we all know in the world of motor cars the name Nethercut is synonymous with perfection. It is JB that really perfected the art of automobile restorations. He set these high standards. He's the one that raised the bar, and he's the only six-time winner at the prestigious Pebble Beach Concorde d'Elegance, which is unbelievable, in my opinion. <laughs> JB has been loyal to our hobby for the past 50 years. He has participated in Pebble Beach since 1958, when he took best of show his first time with his 1930 DuPont. But in all the years of this world-class show, only one man has been honored at Pebble Beach as the honored mark, and that's J.B. Nethercutt. Also honoring J.B. on this auspicious occasion was America's Grand Thank Prix you, world champion, Phil Hill. First, I'd like to say that it's an honor to be able to say that I've known J.B. for 46, 47 years, and I've watched this collection grow into what is most likely the finest in the world. His tastes are not bound by any one era or style or country of origin, but have always been guided by an appreciation for elegance, beauty, grace, and above all, engineering excellence. J.B. Nethercutt's vision of the future is one in which we can look back to the past and revel in what mankind has achieved. Every car within the walls of these museums is a benchmark of one kind or another. As JB has said more than once, and I quote, this collection will be available for the public and it shall be preserved and perpetuated as far as the human mind can conceive. The Nethercut collection consists of over 200 cars, from turn of the century horseless buggies to modern automobiles. Before expanding into the new building, the collection was entirely exhibited across the street in San Silmar. Named after San Simeon's Hearst Castle because of its opulence, it features a grand showroom fashioned after classic era car dealerships one might have visited while shopping for a Packard or Duesenberg. In addition, JB's collection also includes rare musical instruments, 
fine art and automobilia. So important is authenticity to JB, he created a full service restoration facility to service his collection. It includes antique machines, such as this wire harness braiding machine to ensure authenticity. In the metal shop, the lost art of shaping still has been reborn. These craftsmen use the same techniques and tools as the fine artisans who originally created these treasures of days gone by. We are so fortunate to have a man who loves to share his passion for things of the past. And JB gave us a rare opportunity to talk about his love for the automobile. My first automobile was a 1923 Chevrolet, of which I have an example in this collection. I bought it by trading a, a 22 caliber rifle and $12 for it. And it was a sorry mess. It was a touring car. But really that amounted to my first restoration in that I bought a sedan body from a wrecking yard and changed the body, putting the sedan body on where the touring had been. Drove it for years and years and many, many, many miles, happy miles. My emotion for the automobile is actually a justifiable obsession. Every car that I have in the collection is a favorite for some reason. It might be because of its beauty, it might be its mechanical excellence, it might be because of its performance, it's its rarity, its desirability. Everyone is a favorite for some reason. The collection is quite complete in that it illustrates all of the strides of automobile engineering that I have recognized as being important. And the car, although it is not a living thing, has actually, in my mind, attained a life of its own. What an experience it is to see some of JB's treasures. Well, that's all for now. This is such a treat for me to share some of the great people of my life with you. Hope you've enjoyed as much as we have, and I hope these stories will make you just a little bit more car crazy. Thanks for watching. Car Crazy has been brought to you by the Meguiar's family of Appearance Car Care Products. Meguiar's, the trusted experts in surface care since 1901.